Good evening. I said, good evening. I just want to point out that you all have an indigenous master of ceremonies, and I took this microphone exactly on time. We. We are breaking stereotypes here today. Please allow me a moment to introduce myself. Aho, Kundamante, Ni Dijinji Makwa, Jimber Jacobs, Ni Tak de Langamau, Ni Mihikanu, Nakako Satowa, Kundamante, and Ni Shik Wewenet. I give you greetings and introduce myself as Bear or Jim Bear Jacobs although I'm in a room with a bunch of preachy folks, so technically it's Reverend Jim Bear Jacobs. <laughs> but you can just please refer to me as Jim Bear. I'm from the Turtle Clan. I'm a citizen of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation, a tribe which is located in eastern Wisconsin. And with goodness in my heart, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all of you today. I mean, take a look around. We're a pretty good looking group, right? I mean, I mean, wait till you see the sounds of blackness take up here. Their fit, I mean, they're all in white. Their fit is just on point today. I show up in a shirt that's barely even ironed, but what are you gonna do? A number of us black and indigenous people of color who are clergy and faith leaders had the honor of sharing lunch with our keynote speaker, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III. And as Dr. Moss was speaking, I was reminded of a favorite quote of mine. It is by the Choctaw scholar Paul Cha'at Smith, and he said, when the religion of the state is amnesia, when the religion of the state is amnesia, then the simple act of remembering will make you a heretic. My friends, Dr. Moss is going to invite us all into a sacred heresy this evening. And I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but I am here for all of it. We remember the trauma that we all felt viscerally in our bodies three years ago today. And you know, you know if the visions of our forefathers in racial justice, and the visions of our grandmothers who fought diligently for our existence, if their visions were realized, none of us would know the name George Floyd. None of us would have cause to gather today. And so tonight we will be invited through prophetic word into the heresy of remembrance, remembering that our work is far from finished. And it is in that vein of remembering that I want to take a moment and acknowledge You know, I just pulled this up and realized that I didn't even, I mean, I told you my name and everything, but I, I mean, I have a fancy title that I didn't even tell you any of that. I'm like the worst self-promoter out there. Uh, so I am the co-director for racial justice for the Minnesota Council of Churches. Our racial justice department is comprised of myself, Reverend Pamela Gojiri, who is off here to the left, she will wave and our incredible 
Administrative Assistant, Ms. Phoebe McGowan, over here. At the Minnesota Council of Churches, we endeavor to speak truth, to educate predominantly white churches, and ultimately lead those churches into the ministry of reparations for Minnesota's black and American Indian communities. You know, it's just, just a little thing we're doing at the council. Your reparations, like we're gonna knock that out by the end of the year, no problem. In that vein of remembrance, I would like to state that as the Minnesota Council of Churches, we remember and acknowledge that we are located on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. We are gathered right now in close proximity to the territories of the Anishinaabe and the Ho-Chunk peoples. This land has been stewarded as a re living relative by the Dakota for generations. The United States government effectively stole this land from the Dakota people through a series of unjust treaties and broken promises, followed, followed by targeted efforts of genocide, ethnic cleansing, and forced removal. The Minnesota Council of Churches, born out of white Protestantism, recognizes our complicity in these matters. The United States government often carried out this injustice in cooperation with institutionalized white churches. The trauma of forced assimilation and the boarding school system is a stain that cannot be washed away. But we repent of that past and turn towards a more just future. We look now to the Dakota people and indeed all Native American communities located in the state of Minnesota as examples of resilience, resistance, and strength. We stand resolute in our commitment to oppose any threat to indigenous culture or tribal sovereignty, be it political, industrial, or religious. We were wrong. We can do better. We will do better. This evening, would not be possible at all without some incredible partnerships. First and foremost, I would like to thank our host this evening, Plymouth Congregational Church. Plymouth Congregational Church it has a storied history. Part of that story is that this congregation has always been on the leading edge of justice in any arena. It is not to say that this church, like all churches, does not have work to do, but at least they're doing work. And any time I make a call to the lead pastor of this congregation, Reverend Dr. Dwayne Davis, he says, Jim Bear, whatever you need. And I am grateful for that partnership that we have had through the years. We also received some generous sponsorships for these events from the Minneapolis Foundation and the Community Renewal Society of Chicago. Uh, I cannot tell you after so many years of doing this work, just trying to piece budgets together to have an event where you don't have to worry about where things are gonna get paid for is just an incredible weight off of our shoulders and so, to those generous donation, uh, donators, thank you. Thank you so much. At this time, I know that at least half of this room is sitting there saying, when's this guy gonna shut up? Because I see that choir sitting down there in the front row, and I think they probably sound better than he does. I mean, you all want me to sing so we can do a comparison, contrast? You don't want that, trust me. I am honored, so honored. When we invited Sounds of Blackness to our event, we literally were throwing a prayer into the universe. <laughs> we said, 
They're not, they're, they're not going to come. They're the sounds of blackness. They got kings and queens to sing for. But when sounds of blackness graciously responded and said that they would love to be here, that prayer to the universe was answered in full. The Grammy award-winning sounds of blackness tires, tireless endeavor, tirelessly endeavors under the direction of Mr. Gary Hines. They have performed on five continents from everyone from people experiencing homelessness, prison inmates, orphans, kings, queens, presidents, ambassadors, diplomats, and heads of state. They have delivered demonstrations on African-American music, culture, and history at every level from preschool to postgraduate and from the Smithsonian Institute to the Kennedy Center. They educate while entertaining at schools, colleges and universities, hospitals, men's and women's prisons, youth, correctional facilities, halfway houses, battered women's shelters, synagogues, mosques, temples, churches, community centers, and corporations. You all are too busy. In 2015, the recording Black Lives Matter, No Justice, No Peace gave resounding voice and added depth to the powerful Black Lives Matter movement. Now, royalty has topped the charts at number 14 and is stirring a young generation to believe in their majesty and ability to change the world. My friends, it is indeed my honor to welcome for our listening, enjoyment, and encouragement and edification today, Sounds of Blackness. Come on now. There's an old philosophy in public speaking that you never let your opening act outshine you. You better be on your game. That's all I'm saying. At this time, I want to invite to the stage uh, a very good friend of mine, Reverend Dr. Dwayne Davis, who is the lead pastor here at Plymouth Congregational Church, and as I've already said, has been an incredible friend and ally, and really a champion of racial justice work here in the Twin Cities for as long as he has been here. Uh, Reverend Dr. Davis, comes to us through the world of politics and policy and finally answered the call to pulpit ministry and we are all the richer for it. If you ever, ever have an opportunity to sit in the congregation where Reverend Dwayne Davis is preaching, take that opportunity. You will not be disappointed, so please, Welcome my good friend and colleague, Reverend Dr. Dwayne Davis. I'm gonna get out of the way as quickly as possible. I just wanna say welcome. Thank you for coming to our home here at Plymouth. On behalf of the clergy, the leaders, the members of Plymouth Congregational Church, welcome here for this moment. This is your home, and I am from Mississippi, so when I say that, I mean you hang out here with us. Uh, I just want to thank uh, my accomplices, and I call them accomplices because uh, it is wonderful to get on the phone and start conspiring with Reverend Jim Bear Jacobs and Pam Gojiri. They, uh, we, when we get together, it is always trying to do this work and I really appreciate that. I'm so uh, grateful to them. I just wanna thank uh, some Plymouth people who have been preparing for this event, preparing for you, preparing to make sure that we uh, come to you and make sure that you have what you need as we welcome this bold prophetic voice that we have here with us tonight. I want to thank uh, Plymouth's Racial Justice Initiative, the, the Plymouth Presence Team, 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Cody Bordeaux and Alex Johnson, our production staff, uh, who are working with Sounds of Blackness. Thank you all. Uh, all of Plymouth Church for making sure that we can do our, our Malcolm Williams and his team. Uh, they have really been preparing for this night. I am also happy because I think this is an indication of what I think we're trying to do and I want to invite you all to find your accomplices and find your coalitions. We need all of us working in this work to get it done and we know what is before us. Let's join together and so I am so glad that my uh, other accomplice, uh, Rabbi Marcy Zimmerman, is here tonight. And I just want to make sure. <laughs> when she texts me, I know I have a job. Uh, but I am so glad to welcome her <laughs> to say a few words. So not so many years ago, this beautiful sanctuary was under construction and the previous senior clergy person here at Plymouth, Jim Gertmanian, called me and said, I know you don't use your sanctuary on Sundays, <laughs> Rabbi Zimmerman, especially in the summer. Can we come and have Plymouth services at Temple Israel? And without hesitation, I said, yes. And it got to the point where some of you got so comfortable in our pews, you didn't want to come home when the work was done. But you did, and thank God for that, because now you have Dr. Dwayne Davis, who is a remarkable human being, an amazing pastor, and a leader next to none. Thank you for having him in this position. And tonight is a Jewish holiday, so I'm bringing our ritual into your sanctuary as a pay forward and for us, for you to return the favor, I think, is what it is. So it is in this moment where we celebrate Shavuot. Now you might want to know, what is Shavuot? Shavuot is the Feast of Weeks. It is the celebration and remembrance of when the Israelite people were standing at Mount Sinai and received the Torah, received the Ten Commandments, which were only 10 of 613. Jews like to excel. We got 613. We've got a problem with that, I have to say. It's a whole cultural thing. But we are here. We're supposed to stay up all night, and we are supposed to study. And when I heard that Reverend Otis Moss was coming here, I said, that is the kind of study on the anniversary. <laughs> That's the kind of study we're going to do tonight. And I want to say that it is this anniversary of the murder of George Floyd where we as a Jewish community would be in no other place than in this sanctuary hearing this speaker inform us, teach us, and inspire us. So thank you. And I, as part of Shavuot, am going to offer a prayer and blessing for this remembrance of when we received Torah at Mount Sinai so long ago. And for us, it is said in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, that this is being given to you who stand here today and all those who are not here, which is very powerful when you think about it, because what it meant was all of us, really, all of us. We're supposed to wear white for Shavuot, so sounds of blackness, you must be Jewish. <laughs> white is not my color, but I put on a white shirt. Um, but it is really amazing to be here, and I offer this prayer for Shavuot, for those of us in the Jewish community who are here gathered with you today. For the expanding grandeur of creation, 
worlds known and unknown, galaxies beyond galaxies, filled with awe and challenging our imaginations. Modim anachnu lach. I'm going to teach you three Hebrew words. Modim. Anachnu. You got to get the chet. Anachnu. Lach. Which means thankfulness. We are thankful to you, God. That's what that means. All right, we continue. I'll tell you when it's your turn. For this fragile planet Earth, its times and tides, its sunsets and seasons, modim anachnu lach. For the joy of human life, its wonders and surprises, its hopes and achievements, modim anachnu. For human community, for our common past and future hopes, our oneness transcending, our capacity to work for peace and justice in the midst of hostility and oppression. Modim anachnu lach. For high hopes and noble causes, for faith without fanaticism, for understanding of views not shared, Modim anachnu lach. For all who have labored and suffered for a fairer world, who have lived so that others might live in dignity and freedom, modim anachnu lach. For human liberties and sacred rights, for opportunities to change and grow, affirm and choose, modim anachnu lach. We pray that we may live not by our fears, but by our hopes, not by our words, but by our deeds. Baruch ata Adonai hatov shimcha ulacha na'er lehodot. Blessed are you, O God. Your name is goodness, and you are worthy of thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Zimmerman and Dr. Davis. I am the uh, co-CEO of the Minnesota Council of Churches. Three years ago today, Memorial Day, returning home from a day out, a rare day out, in the early days of the pandemic, heard on the radio that a black man had been killed by police. Later discovered that this was George Perry Floyd, whose life was taken, 10 blocks from where I live. By the next day, protests began to emerge and unrest. And here we are three years later. As was noted, we had a luncheon today uh, uh, for black, indigenous, Asian, Latin A folk to talk through the last three years and to seek healing, but not just three years, a lifetime of dealing with racism. And tonight we gather to invite our esteemed speaker, Dr. Moss, to speak to all of us, but in particular to whites. We call it shifting the spotlight. I'll let him talk about that when he gets up here. But what we saw three years ago was an amazing multiracial protest outburst with lots of white people in it. <clears throat> We're three years later now. What's the state of white folks in the work of racial justice? So I am the white co-CEO. So I welcome you into this exploration and interrogation of whiteness tonight. My co-CEO, Elder Stacy Smith uh, uh, led at the luncheon and invited uh, our BIPOC uh, leaders uh, into a similar conversation. So that's kind of what's happening. I want to introduce our speaker, Otis Moss. You've had a chance, I'm sure, to read the biographical information. He's been the pastor, the senior pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ. I see next Sunday is your anniversary. 15 years, um, 
he followed the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright uh, at a very interesting moment when Barack Obama, a congregation member, was running for president. And he's led uh, with amazing skill and wisdom and giftedness. Before coming to this position, I worked in Chicago uh, as the executive director of the Community Renewal Society. My successor, Waltrina Middleton, is with us tonight. Um, and my wife and I attended Trinity United Church of Christ and had a chance to uh, be enriched by that experience. As an aside, one Sunday we were there, the sounds came to Trinity and sang, and you'll remember this, Gary, because as you were singing, the tape stopped playing. And you were in mid-motion singing, and the Trinity band just stepped right in and carried as though they didn't miss a moment. <clears throat> That's what you get at Trinity United Church Christ. High level of excellence, commitment to community on the front lines of racial justice. Reverend Dr. Otis Moss is a noted preacher. Uh, some years ago, he was invited to give the esteemed Lyman Beecher lectures. If you are a preacher, a student of preacher, you know that that's an important honor. He's an activist. You always see him out on the streets and things happening in Chicago and around the country. He's a theologian and an author. And it's just an honor for me to have my friend, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss, in the pulpit tonight. Before he comes to speak, my other friends, the sounds of blackness, 52 years. Mr. Knight, we're glad you're with us today. And Gary, take us to the throne of grace. I feel a little bit optimistic at this moment. <laughs> I am grateful and thankful for this invitation to be with you on, on this day. As we remember, in the words of of Reverend Jim Baer that we become collective heretics because we choose to remember. To be in this space and to remember uh, the pain and the horror, uh, the hurt and the harm uh, that we witnessed three years ago. But we remember the pain, the horror, the hurt and the harm that we witness every day. We are in this space, and we are grateful to be in this space, that we refuse to operate with the sickness of amnesia that keeps a nation from flourishing. And so I'm grateful. I'm grateful to the Council of Churches for, for this invitation. I am grateful for uh, my partner and brother in the struggle Reverend Jim Baer, we thank you for, for your witness and, and for your work. I'm grateful for the pastor of this, of this special congregation. Here we are in Plymouth Congregational Church <laughs> having a conversation in reference to racial justice. What a blessing. My grandmother would say, We've come a mighty, mighty long way. I'm also grateful to uh, my, my partner and brother in the struggle, none other than Reverend Curtis DeYoung. Uh, we are grateful for, for your work and, and for your witness and for all of those who are a part of getting into some good trouble together. And we are just delighted that you're here. I have to just give a major shout out to Sounds of Blackness, that you all are just something else. I already told the Hines, he said, I, I don't know, I'm just like really super excited uh, just to be in the same space with you all. Um, there's been so many moments at the Sounds of Blackness, your, your music and your witness as allowed me to get through some of the most challenging moments in my life. And I thank you for your ministry. You are based here in Minneapolis, but your music and your sound circles the globe. And the beautiful thing about sound, yes. 
And I believe, it's, as, as science tells us, that any sound that is uttered never disappears, it may dissipate. Which means that whatever you have presented, whatever you sing a song, it's still circling the globe. And I believe that sometimes someone who is encouraged and they don't know why, they may have bumped into one of your songs <laughs> and didn't even know it. And so we are grateful and we are thankful on, on this day. I, I want to take this, this moment uh, as we are talking about uh, today the shifting of the spotlight. The shifting of the spotlight, which is a challenge for some, a blessing to others, a new paradigm for some. For some, it is turning the world upside down. For others, it is turning the world right side up that as we talk about shifting uh, the spotlight. Uh, it is similar to when uh, a person has written a script and they are directing a play or maybe even a film. And there is one uh, who says, uh, here is your part. And then there's another that says, no, 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 I'm supposed to be in the starring role. I said, no, we have a part for you. It's just that you're not going to be in the starring role, uh, which places you in a space where there must be a shift. And so we want to talk a little bit about this shift in terms of this spotlight idea. And there are a couple of things that I want to lift up before we even begin uh, to deal with a couple of pieces of scripture and a poem that I would like for us to just meditate on for a moment. It is Isaiah, Rabbi, who speaks so powerfully in the first chapter in the 17th verse, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the case, the cause of the widow. To give the OM3 translation, that's the Otis Moss III translation, and that'll be out next year, edited by Reverend Jim Baer, amen. Uh, we could read it this way, educate yourself on justice and seek it. Correct a forms of oppression and bring justice to those who are parentless and plead the case of poor sisters in the courthouse. Learn to do good, seek justice. And then there is another piece that I think is appropriate on this day that I want to lift up as we talk about shifting the spotlight. It is a poem by a gentleman by the name of Ross Gay. Ross Gay wrote a poem years ago in reference to Eric Garner. But I believe that it is appropriate on this day as we remember as heretics because we choose to build a different world. And the name of the poem is simply a small needful fact. And it goes this way, a small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec, horticultural department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants, which most likely some of them in all likelihood continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for all of us to breathe. A small, needful fact. How do we create a world of allies, accomplices, and co-conspirators who are willing to get into some good trouble or holy mischief. How do we do this? And I would submit uh, that, that I'm, I'm challenged. I'm challenged by the word uh, allies. And the reason I'm challenged by the word allies is really because of history. Because in World War II, we had some allies that decided to change uh, what was written in the treaty. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure that we seek allies. 
And I'm not sure about the word accomplices. Because according to uh, the Department of Justice, they usually uh, target an accomplice to cut a deal with the DA. But co-conspirators can't shift the treaty. Co-conspirators don't uh, make a deal with the DA. We stand together because we are committed to good trouble and we are committed to getting into holy mischief. And so I'll invite everyone that we would be co-conspirators together, not allies, uh, not accomplices, but let us stand before those who do not want to see this democracy flourish in these yet to be United States of America. And let us stand together holding arms locked in struggle to say that we envision a world that is not yet, but will be because we dare have a prophetic imagination. In other words, we, 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 we envision what has not yet been, but we shall function as if it already is. Because imagination is one of the most dangerous things you can place into the spirit of a child or a people. And we lose it when we are adults. We lose the possibility of imagination. And that is why it is important for us to spend some time with children. Because children know what imagination can do. I want to tell you one of the greatest uh, toys I ever bought my children. I have a boy and a girl. My, my son just graduated from Morehouse. Praise God. Amen. My daughter is in her first year of college. The greatest toy I ever got them. I was, you know, working on getting different toys and whatnot when they were little, but the greatest toy that they ever had was a refrigerator box. <laughs> Everything we had ever purchased, it was nothing better than the refrigerator box. I'd come in the living room one day, I said, what are y'all doing? They said, we are in a spaceship right now. We're going to the moon. I'd leave out, I'd come back, and I'd say, oh, oh, what spaceship, and where are you going now? They said, Dad, can't you tell we're in a bus right now? <laughs> I said, excuse me. I left the room, came back again, and I said, oh, you still on the bus? They're like, can't you see? This is a car, Dad. <laughs> Their imagination was flourishing. They took a simple cardboard box. It became a spaceship, it became a bus, and it was a car. But when we grow up, life knocks the imagination out of us. And we don't even have the possibility to imagine what a nation can be because our imagination, regardless of where you are in this nation, has been colonized by forces that want us to function under the status quo. We must liberate our imagination so that we can see possibilities that are not yet, but we're going to function as if it already is. That's the power of imagination. And the most dangerous thing, as I stated, that you can place in the, in, into the hearts of a people is imagination. It is uh, Albert Einstein who said, I would rather have someone have imagination than genius. The genius can add numbers, but the one with imagination can create new things. And it's not, it's more than just adding numbers together, it's being able to conceive. And that is why within the Old Testament and the New Testament, you had imagineers. They were not called imagineers then, but they were called poets and prophets that used to imagine possibilities for the nation of Israel. Within the New Testament, we have an imagineer, an imagineer, an imagineer by the name of Jesus who is imagining uh, new possibilities for humanity. It is imagination that our nation lacks. It is not money, it is not resources, but it is solely imagination of what we can be and what we can do together. And that becomes the challenge. But if we, if we are to look at this idea of shifting the spotlight, if we are to look and how, 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 how do we become co-conspirators together to get in good trouble and holy mischief collectively? 
That one must understand that, that I believe, that I believe for, for some communities, the trajectory of African American life, the life of any person of color, any person who is indigenous, any person in this nation, is the recognition that has been on the margins of this, of this world, is that we recognize the beauty, the blessing, and the burden of our position. Uh, yes, that if you are a person that has ever been on the margin, the unique thing that with you live within this nation we call America, that, that everyone, especially me, myself, uh, as a person of African descent, uh, that we speak in multiple dialects. We are trilingual. As a matter of fact, I can stand here, I can speak academic, ecclesiastical, black Pentecostal if I need to, or go to Baptist, or with urban sensibilities with a southern vibe. It all depends. <laughs> on where I am. I've got a tri dialect depending upon the community that I'm standing before. Just like the sounds of blackness, they, they, they don't just sing black music, they sing within a pentatonic scale and a heptatonic scale. They know how to clap on the one and the three and the two and the four. So, 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 so we go, can, can you help me out a minute? So those of you may be confused about the two and the four and the one and the three. For those in Plymouth, you probably clap on the one and the three. For those who come out to black church, you clap on the two and the four. And so, and so, Brother Hines, can you help us out so that we could just, just do a little demonstration of the difference between clapping on the one and the three or clapping on the two and the four? All right, can you hook us up right now? All right. Come on, y'all join in. Come on, y'all can get it. There we go. All right, now we're going to clap on the two and the four. And when you clap on the two and the four, you start putting a little flavor on it. <laughs> Got to put some flavor within there, within the beats. And so you have two traditions. And the challenge in America is America thinks the entire world should only clap on the one and the three. When the reality is, is that we have so many people that also clap on the two and the four. And when you create a hierarchy on when you should clap, you end up creating a marginalization of a certain group of people instead of recognizing that you can also do James Brown funk on the one and the three, or you can break down sounds of blackness on the two and the four. You can do those things together. And when you bring them together, something powerful happens in the midst of it. Pentatonic and hepatonic. hepatonic. And that is the thing, that is the thing, that those who have been on the margins, those within the trajectory of, of the African-American community, that we are tri-dialectical, we are trilingual. In other words, we have to learn a variety of dialects and a variety of information. But when you only have to learn the one and the three, you're missing out on 70% of the world. For example, for example, that, that, that I, I love literature. I love reading the works of Mark Twain. I, I love Ernest Hemingway. I, I love Mary Shelley and Jane Austen. But, but those are not the only ones I love. I also got to read me some Zora Neale Hurston and some James Baldwin and Richard Wright and Toni Morrison. And when you merge the two together, when you got a two and four and a one and three, You've got a more complex idea of what the world is. And so what I say to you this day is also expand, in the words of Jay Dilla, uh, the producer and DJ, expand the crate of where you pull your music from so that you can hear more than just one sound, but a variety of sounds. You see, you see, when you are tri-dialectical, when you are trilingual, um, for example, for example, within, within the African-American community, if someone in the family says, well, guess what? Little Tyrone is a Muslim now. And then someone will say, well, is he in the nation? Is he 5%? No, he's not wearing a bow tie. Is he in a cipher? No. Oh, he, oh, he prays four five times a day. Oh, I know which one he's in. For others, 
they just make an assumption that it's just one group. Because when you are trilingual, you understand the variety and the complexity within a particular community. Ah, an education that we need to create is an education that is multilingual and tridialectical. An education that says, you know what, I can listen to Joni Mitchell, uh, I can vibe with Bob Dylan, I can hang out with Prince, I can sing with Stevie, and I can shout with Aretha. But at the same time, I can still croon with some uh, Luther, I can recite some Queen, and I still can get on my journey, but I still like Rakim, Nas, The Roots, and Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> While still maintaining my love uh, for uh, Mahalia, the Clark sisters, Richard Smallwood, Kirk, Ricky Dillard, and Tamala Mann. That you can bring all of these things together, not create a hierarchy of one is superior and inferior. You see it as a circle and not a line that they're sitting across from each other, bringing something that God has given each of them. So expand your repertoire. Expand it beyond just the one and the three, but also the two and the four. Mm, these multilingual dialects. It is one that Hazel Carby, she calls it this way, it calls the creolization of American culture. Uh, that, that one community has been moved into a space where they uh, creolize uh, everything. In other words, they draw from many and pieces from different communities consistently trying to hear the echo of how God is speaking in those communities. And I tell you that if we are willing to listen beyond the one and the three, you're going to have some new flavor and beats in your life. That something unique will happen in this country. And that's what the civil rights movement did for a nation. A nation that said we only can play on the one and the three. But Dr. King said, no, we're going to do this on the two and the four. Uh, Joanne Robinson said we're going to do this on the two and the four. Uh, we must begin to create a new repertoire in a nation, which means if you are to be a co-conspirator, that you must be willing to expand what you listen to and what you read. The expansion of that. But here is the thing, to, 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 to be uh, co-conspirators uh, is to be in a, a position to open oneself to decolonizing your empathy. To decolonize your empathy. It means uh, removing the assumption of inferiority and walk with the givenness of brilliance. What does that mean? It means, it means that there is a, a functional de a colonization in terms of how we see people, people uh, who are of color, people who are black, people who are indigenous with an assumption of inferiority or assumption of victimization, an assumption that there is nothing to bring to the table. I'm telling you, if you spend some time in a black community, you're going to find some beauty unlike beauty you've ever seen in your life. If you spend some time, you're going to witness some things that will bless your life. And so I stand here. See, I, I'm going to do a little improvisation at this moment right now that, 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 that as I'm here, I know that I have, I have some graduates in this space uh, who are graduates of a school known as Howard University. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Come on, make some noise of the Howard folks in here. Uh-huh. Uh, and I have some graduates in this space of people from like Morehouse College and other spaces, you know, historically black colleges. And there, there is a blessing that happens every year usually either around Mother's Day or the week after Mother's Day, an HBCU has a graduation. And to witness a graduation of all of these wonderful and proud graduates, that's why I was shouting at my son's graduation at Morehouse College, the only school for African-American males, to see 406 young men walk across the stage was absolutely incredible to witness. But you see, every HBCU starts out clapping on the one and three. Starts out with pomp and circumstance. But see, they always forget, Big Mama shows up every year. 
And there's always somebody saying, please hold your applause to all the graduates of the class of 2023 <laughs> have received their degrees. But see, they forget Big Mama's showing up. And she's been praying for the last 22 years. And when her child walks across the stage, there will be a shout and we go from the one and three to two and four and it becomes a Pentecostal revival meeting because somebody's hollering in the back, thank you, Jesus, because they say that degree's mine too because I paid for it. And here in the midst of that moment, in the midst of these institutions, you have the opportunity to witness, a witness uh, an opportunity through a window and a gaze that wider culture does not focus on. Absolute brilliance of young people. I remember, I remember when my wife graduated from Spelman, uh, her uh, commencement speaker was Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou stood up talking to all of the graduates of Spelman College. And she says, I want you to know that wherever you go, whether it is in a law school, whether it is graduate school, whether it is a, some particular job, when you walk through the door, always know you never walk alone. Know to the left of you is your great-great-grandmother. Know to the, left, to the right of you is Harriet Tubman. In front of you is Mary McLeod Bethune. Behind you is Fannie Lou Hamer. Never walk into a room thinking you are walking by yourself. It's extraordinary. And every young woman in that class remembered the words of Maya Angelou on that day. As a matter of fact, even after, after the particular uh, the graduation ceremony, you saw a whole lot of sisters said, I can't wait to walk in the room because I'm walking in the room with other people with me. There's this extraordinary brilliance within these particular communities that if you take the time and witness, it will begin to decolonize your empathy, where your empathy will become empathy and not sympathy. And something will happen in your heart and in your spirit where you will no longer look through the gaze of a wider culture, but you'll be able to see through the eyes of the way in which the divine views us all as being children of the Most High God. That is God, what God calls us to do, to remove the assumptions of inferiority and walk in the givenness of brilliance. The givenness of brilliance. Brilliance that is already resting in a community. Instead of rattling off, here are the problems, here are the issues, we all, we all got challenges. But to understand that there is such brilliant, uh, brilliant and beauty within our communities. I'm reminded what my, my father shared with me several years ago, Reverend Waltrina. He talked about the brilliance of Dr. King. He said that many people always want to lift up. He went to Boston. Uh, he studied Walter Mulder. He looked at uh, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. And my dad said, no, 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 that's not where his brilliance came from. If you want to find out about his brilliance, you need to visit Auburn Avenue, the fourth ward of Atlanta and understand the community from which he came out of, and in that community, you will witness brilliance that was already inherent. And so my father shared the story, and if I may paint the picture for you, that when Dr. King was about the age of 14, uh, that he would come out of his house. On one side of Auburn Avenue were these middle-class homes. Where on that side, there were the preachers, the doctors, and the lawyers on one side of the street. He comes out of his house, and one side of the street, again, middle-class homes, the person who owns the insurance company, uh, the person who is the pharmacist on one side of the street. But on the other side of the street are shotgun homes, the homes of the domestic, the homes of the ones who sold coal, the ones who are struggling just to make ends meet. On one side, middle class. On the other side, those who are struggling just to make it that when he comes out of his home, he sees the dichotomy within America right in front of him. But when he turns left and begins to walk up Auburn Avenue to go to his father's church on Sunday, before he even gets to his father's church, he witnesses this brilliance and this beauty 
The first business he passes is the Harbrooks Funeral Home. The Harbrooks Funeral Home was owned uh, by Sister Harbrooks. Sister Harbrooks was the only black woman to own a funeral home in the state of Georgia. So just by walking to his father's church, he saw the glass ceiling of patriarchy being broken by a woman by the name of Sister Harbrooks. But after he passed by that funeral home, he then walked by a radio station, a radio station called WERD, Word Radio. And Word Radio was the radio station that lifted up the music of Mahalia Jackson, Thomas Dorsey, but also gave information about lynching in America. A station that was owned by an African American. He had already seen the brilliance of this woman who broke the glass ceiling, then walks by a media company that was lifting up the music within the community, but at the same time telling people about lynching across America. But then he passed by the word radio station and then passes by the Atlanta Daily World. The Atlanta Daily World was the only African, daily African-American paper in America. Now, there are those who may remember the Chicago Defender, but the Chicago Defender was a weekly paper. But the Atlanta Daily World was a daily paper. Can you imagine opening up a paper and reading stories written by W.E.B. Du Bois? Can you open up a paper and read uh, the reprints of Ida B. Wells? Open up a paper and read the commencement address of Mary McLeod Bethune. That was the paper that he read, that his father read on a daily basis. And he walked by that paper that was again owned by a person of African descent. But he's not yet even arrived at his father's church. Before he arrives at his father's church, he has to pass by the T.M. Alexander Insurance Company. This insurance company, the second floor of that insurance company, uh, allowed and gave free offices to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference so that they would have a home, a, a place to do business. But the, uh, the Alexander Insurance Company is important in reference to the transformation of the social landscape of America. Because in Montgomery, Alabama, when they had that bus boycott, uh, and they said that they would no longer ride the bus, and black folks said, you know what we're going to do? Uh, we're going to, you know, just have uh, uh, people ride together. We're going to carpool. But then the state of Alabama did something to keep black people from riding together. They made it illegal for a black person to ride in a car with more than one person, that being the driver. So you had to just drive yourself, trying to force people to get back on the bus. And it was the organizers of the Montgomery Improvement Association uh, who were trying to get insurance, uh, taxi insurance, because they said if you pick up somebody, you are acting like a taxi, and you would then be pulled over, ticketed, or placed in jail. And so not a single insurance company in the United States would insure cars in Montgomery, Alabama. And it was T.M. Alexander of the Alexander Insurance Company. Uh, they came over to Montgomery, Alabama, met with the Montgomery Improvement Association. He said, I will try to find someone to underwrite so that black people can just carpool. Can you imagine that? Just to carpool together. And so T.M. Alexander could not find a single insurance company in the United States. But he would not be deterred. He decided to hop on a plane in Atlanta, then make his way to New York, then got on another plane and landed in London, England, and met with the Lloyds of London. And the Lloyds of London underwrote the insurance from Montgomery, Alabama. In other words, black people had Uber before Uber even knew what Uber was. <laughs> Again, that brilliance. And he's walking past that brilliance. He has not even gotten to his father's church. And before he gets to Ebenezer Baptist Church, he then stops by in the balcony of a church known as Wheat Street Baptist Church. Wheat Street Baptist Church that was pastored by a person by the name of William Holmes Borders. William Holmes Borders, who stood roughly about six, five and a half, looked like a fullback. Uh, he was a graduate of Morehouse College, but was also a poet. And he would close his messages with poetry. As a matter of fact, some of you have heard some of his poetry because it's been remixed so many times by so many different people. Uh, he would close a message in this manner, and this poem is in the Library of Congress. 
One of his most famous poems is, I am somebody. I am a poet in Langston Hughes. I am a scholar in W.E.B. Du Bois. I am, I am a pilot in Bessie Strong. I am a writer in Zora Neale Hurston. I am an institution builder in Booker T. Washington. And it is, it is known that Dr. King would sit in the balcony listening to this man, but not only listening to him, it was the image of this man, because it was William Holmes Borders who played Jesus in the Atlanta Passion Play. I didn't say the Atlanta Black Passion Play. I said the Atlanta Passion Play. So the image of Jesus for Dr. King was a six foot five black man, is what I'm trying to tell you. This is before he even arrived at his father's church. And then he arrived at his father's church. And all of that love and all of that pouring into him and when he made his decision to go to Morehouse College, he then took a trolley over to Morehouse College. After walking out of his house, past all of these institutions, he then got on a trolley. My father says it this way, during that time period in the 1940s, he was forced to get on the back of the trolley. He said, but you see, he got in the back of the trolley, but his mind was always in the front because he had already passed by so much excellence that had already been dumped into him that by the time he had landed, when he arrived on the campus of Morehouse College and Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays welcomed him at that moment. That was the theological foundation for Dr. King. He had already learned how to clap on the two and the four and the one and the three. And that is what we must do collectively in this nation. Remove the assumption of inferiority and walk with the givenness of brilliance. But here is the other thing that we must also recognize if we are to be co-conspirators, that we must connect with our ethnicity as a pathway to partnership. We connect with our ethnicity as a pathway to partnership. That, that may be confusing to some people, so let me see if I can, can break it down so you understand what I'm trying to say. As that, that local is always universal. That when you go to your own particularity, uh, that it always becomes universal. Let, 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 let me help you out. Now here in this room, uh, we have a variety of people, and that we have a tendency to use the social construction of race when we are talking. The social construction of race is different from ethnicity. Because of all of us, especially those who consider themselves to be white, if you got on a plane uh, right here in Minneapolis and you flew to Europe, they would never say, welcome white people. What they would say is, you are an American. They would hear your last name and they would wonder, what is your ethnicity? And with ethnicity, there is history. With ethnicity, there is music. With ethnicity, there is food. And you see, there is no particular white food. But when you have your ethnicity, you recognize the food and the music and the culture. And when you do that, you find that there is a connection with other people in the process. Because when we reconnect to our ethnicity, we put ourselves in partnership to be able to dismantle things in this nation. And we begin to dismantle the social construction of race because we become ethnic again. Let, let me help you out, uh, that during the antebellum period in, in America, the reason that we even had this idea of social construction of race, when people of African descent arrived in this country, they used the term African, and everybody used a particular ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic uh, phrasing in terms of understanding who they were. And something happened in Virginia, it was called the Bacon Rebellion, that black people and indentured servants, they got together, and he said, you know what, the real problem is the person who owns that big house over there. So let's deal with that individual. At that moment, the laws in Virginia changed, and they changed in this way. Uh, they did not give uh, different wages for indentured servants. They just gave certain privileges to indentured servants. Always remember that you are not one of those, and they stopped using the word African and start using a word that begins with an N. And that then begins that social construction specifically to ensure that groups of people that had commonality would not recognize their commonality. 
It is one writer by the name of David Rodiger. He calls it the wages of whiteness. As long as I can keep you in a moment of resentment, as long as I can keep saying to you that someone's taking from you, then I can become governor of Florida. Using that when in reality we have so much in common that we want to see a transformation not only for our children's children but seven generations out so that our great, 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 great grandchildren will say there once were a people that decided to break down all of the systems so that we all could flourish as children of the Most High God. The challenge the challenge for us in this moment is when the spotlight shifts, is can we be co-conspirators? Can we be ready uh, when our name is called? Now, I have to, have to mention this, uh, Reverend Young. I'm a, I'm a fan of basketball. I'm a basketball head. I just love basketball, all forms of a WNBA, NBA. College does not make a difference on the street. Yeah, I don't care. I love basketball. I do. It's a beautiful sport. Uh, it's an elegant sport. It's a creative sport. It reminds me more of jazz than any other sport because someone is always doing some improvisation in the midst of basketball. I love it. I'm like, you know, is this the monk of basketball? Is this the cold train over here? I love to see what people do. Ah, but there's something that happened during, uh, during uh, these NBA playoffs uh, when the LA Lakers were, were playing. There was a young man by the name of Lonnie Walker IV. Uh, Lonnie the Walker IV was originally a starter on the LA Lakers until there was a demographic change on the team. Let me help you out. Let me say it again. He was a starter until there was a demographic change on the team. And because of the demographic change, he lost his starting position. He was not put off the team. His position just changed. And so now he was on the bench and there was a moment when they desperately needed him and they called Lonnie Walker up uh, to get on the court. And there in the last uh, about 11 minutes, he scored 15 points. And when they interviewed him, they said, uh, Lonnie, how did you do this? You used to be a starter. You were put on the side. And the first thing he says, you got to understand, I'm for this team. I want to see this team flourish because when the team does well, I do well. But he said, the other thing is I always work with my father. And my father told me, he said, you need to be ready so you don't have to get ready. So you need to make sure that when they call your name, you are ready to get out on the court. And you must understand that you are part of a team. Now, there are some, there were some who pouted and were mad they lost their starting position. And they wanted to protest the coach that there was some critical race theory that was going on that was keeping him from having the position. Ah, but you see, Lonnie Walker said, no, no, I'm for the team. And the question must come before us. Are we for this democracy? No matter where we are, no matter our particular location, do we know when this democracy flourishes? We all flourish. When this democracy grows, we all grow. When this democracy is healthy, we are all healthy. When we recognize that, that can be the pin that we place upon the map that we are moving toward. Ah, this is the thing that we must recognize, that we are all a part of team democracy. And when this happens, when these moments happen, then something new can happen in the process. New music can be created in these yet to be United States of America. I'm reminded of the beautiful music that comes out of that incredible uh, city known as New Orleans. New Orleans, there's nothing like jazz music. Jazz music, which is an amalgamation, a creolization of music that comes from the African tradition, the indigenous tradition, that comes from uh, the Spanish tradition, Jewish and French all together. And in a place known as the Congo Square, that on Sundays, uh, those people of African descent could hear the sounds of so many other traditions. And as a result, something new was created in the process that we know as jazz music. And I believe that we need a jazz ethic in America because the beautiful thing about jazz is that jazz does something that no other tradition does. 
because everybody in a jazz band is allowed to solo. Let me see if I can break it down because jazz music uh, brings together instruments that are not supposed to play together. Because the saxophone, that's for the marching band. The piano, that is for the classical European music. And the drum set is supposed to be played not with polyrhythms, but now it is being played in a different manner. And the bass is to be played with a bow, not with your fingers. But in jazz music, everybody is given the opportunity to solo. In other words, each person's unique cultural perspective is allowed to contribute to the music that is being created in that moment. And when we create a jazz ethic in this nation, we will create a new music. And that is the beautiful thing about jazz. You will never hear the saxophone saying to the uh, trump, saying, saying to the piano, you have to sound just like me. You'll never hear the piano fussing at the drum set, you better sound like me. You'll never hear the drum set saying to the bass, you have to sound like me. Everybody has the right to solo. No matter where you come from, where you are on your journey, you have something to contribute to this democracy. And I believe that if we learn a jazz ethic in this nation, we will create a new song. I believe in the words of John Coltrane, a love supreme. So I must bid you good day, but let us create some new music. I bid you good day. Let us create some new songs. I bid you good day. Let's create a new jazz ethic of democracy in this nation. Good day. May God bless you. And let's play a new song. all been taken to church today. <clears throat> I told you to bring your game. I'm glad you listened to me. Friends, this evening has been the fulfillment of an incredible amount of hard work, planning, prayer, sweat, tears. You being here is just such an incredible validation of the work that those of us who commit our time, our bodies, and our lives to racial justice helps us feel that maybe we can use our imaginations again. Maybe we can, maybe we can live in a world that is not yet. We can live as though we are there. I want to, as we draw our evening to a close, I want to again offer some incredible gratitude. First and foremost, to all of our friends who are part of Plymouth Congregational Church, Reverend Dr. Davis, to all of the staff, Cody and others, and the volunteers who helped make this event possible. Thank you, thank you so much. You have... You have no idea what a relief it is when planning large events like this to not have to worry about the minutia of the finer details of things. You know that people are gonna have refreshments, they're gonna have cookies, they're gonna know where the bathrooms are. Thank you, thank you so much. Again, uh, deep gratitude and I would invite Sounds of Blackness, would you please stand one more time and just receive our gratitude.
don't know, Gary, was that applause on the one and the three? Was it the two? Was it... Some folks are still learning. So. Again, last but not least, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss. At our luncheon this afternoon for BIPOC clergy and faith leaders, we invited Dr. Moss to be pastoral, and he delivered. Tonight, the invitation for Dr. Moss was to be prophetic, and he excelled. Thank you. Thank you. As we draw our evening to a close, I would invite you all, Dr. Moss has a book. Uh, we have some copies that are for sale that will take place in the Guild Hall. There is an opportunity to have some of those books signed. Um, there is uh, other informational tables and merchandise available uh, in the Guild Hall. Please avail yourself of that opportunity. We timed our event in such a way so that we would not at all conflict with memorials, remembrances, and vigils that are taking place down at 38th and Chicago at George Floyd Square. I would invite all of you to spend some time on that sacred ground, to plant your feet in the space where a child of God drew his last breath and to open up your minds and imagine a world where we have undone the systems of oppression, where mothers and fathers can send their babies out into the world and not fear that they won't come home. Plant your feet on that sacred ground, shed your tears, lift a prayer. This is the sacred work we are all called into. Amen. Thank you so much.